just this one verse this morning out of Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 16. So let's read that 16th verse together here together this morning in Proverbs chapter 21. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. And let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, that we're able to hold in our hands your precious word. We ask that your spirit would, Lord, through the preaching of the word of God, Lord, minister or speak, challenge our hearts. Lord, draw us closer to you. And Lord, use our preacher filling with your spirit. Please meet with us, Lord, and make this a special service. Thank you for allowing us to be here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So what in the world kind of an inspirational verse is verse 16 for a Sunday morning sermon? Is that what you were thinking? I figured it was. Finally got down to your level. I... It is an odd verse, and as Brother Penn read it with us, I was thinking the very same thing. What an odd, what an odd verse. But it is, but it's a good one. Proverbs 21 and verse 16 gives some tremendous insight. And that's what we're going to look at today. But what is that insight about as to why good Christians make tragic mistakes and the choices that cause them to go astray? We often ask, how could they do that? They were in the right church. They were from a right family. They've been saved for a number of years. How could they make this step backwards? How could they make this step away from the will of God? How could they change their convictions? How could they change their beliefs? How could they change their practices? And the Bible gives the answer. Right here in verse 16, it said, notice with me, if you would please, the word, uh, the word there, the, the word wandereth. What does it mean? It carries a number of different meanings with us, all pointing back to the same word. It means to err. It means to go astray. It means literally to wander as it has here. That's one of its actual meanings, to wander. It means to be seduced. Amazing. Seduced. It means to stagger. It means to go out of the way. And it means to be deceived. Amazing. One little word, when the Bible says in verse 16, the man that wandereth, the man that errs, the man that goes astray, the man that wanders, the man that is seduced, the man that staggers, the man that goes out of the way, the man that is deceived, it tells us about that. It gives us insight. And often believers, good believers, will wander away from the way of understanding. And what are the causes, though, that cause him to wander away? Does it happen all of a sudden? You know, people use the phrase, oh, he fell into sin. No one falls into sin. They walk into it headlong. It may take them a while to get there, but it's a series of decisions. This morning in Sunday school, I went and straightened the eagle up on our flag. And I said, there are no little things in life. Everything, everything, or there are no big things in life. Everything is a little thing because little things add up to big things. That crooked eagle has been bothering me for a long time. Kind of like Daniel, that nail that was over here on this wall, been bothering me for a long time. You finally pulled it out of the wall. And this past week, I found two more over here on this wall. So now I'm bothered. I'm going to have to go back and do it. As I was walking up the stairs, I found a small piece of flooring that they put in, a little, little tiny piece. I picked it up off of the carpeting because everything in life, it's all little things. And when somebody goes into sin, it's not because they just jump into some big sin. It's because they take a number of little steps to get there. Like the girl that I knew when I was growing up, the teenage girl, she ended up getting pregnant out of wedlock. And she said to me one day, Danny, I don't know what happened. And I looked at her and I said, you're a liar. I said, you know exactly what happened. She put her head down and she was ashamed and she, uh, she did. She knew exact, every single step she took to get where she was, she knew the steps. She didn't fall into that. It happened one little step at a time. And so uh, what are the causes that make a good Christian wander from the way of understanding, from the way of having proper discernment about things in life? What causes that to happen? Now, I'm going to be accusatory right now of everybody in this room. Everybody here has fallen away in one way or another from walking with the Lord and been backslidden at one time or another. 
Everybody here has. I do not know of a single Christian anywhere in the world that has walked with God faithfully every single year, every single day of their lives. Most everybody that I know of has had a time where they have walked away. They have turned away. Some have even quit and some have come back, you see. So, but what causes that? What causes them to no longer be able to discern what's right from wrong and what's proper or improper or what's holy from unholy? What causes that? Even Isaiah, the prophet, says in chapter 5 and verse 20, and many of us in recent days in our communication with others, our written communication, we have referred to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, especially in the way things are going in our present political condition here in our country. It says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We are living in a time where people have turned everything backwards and there seems to be no discernment. There seems to be no propriety. There seems to be, uh, there seems to be no common sense. But what causes good Christians, not just our government, but what causes Christians who have been believers perhaps for a very long time, what would cause them to take a step to the left or to walk away from what they've believed all of their lives? As I said, there are no large decisions. Everything is a small decision. It turns into a large, a large decision. So what does the Bible have to say? Well, it all comes out of Proverbs 21 and verse 16. It tells us what these ways are by application. So I want you to hear these today because I think you'll see very plainly that they simply make sense, okay? Number one, if you're taking notes, they wander physically. They wander physically. Wrong road, wrong place, wrong path. Many years ago, when I was in 1976, we went to Boston, Massachusetts to uh, help a man start a church. His name was Bob White, of all things. Bob White. And we went out there to help him start his church. We passed out tracts. We did all kinds of things. But we had to make a journey one day through uh, Boston. And I remember that one of them said, don't look outside for very long. We're passing through what they call uh, the combat zone. And I said, what is the combat zone? They said, this is the place of prostitution. Well, that's the wrong path for somebody to stop and stay. We passed through it because it was on our journey where we had to get where we were going. But we did not stop. But we're talking about a physical wandering. And according to the meaning of the word, it involves literally a physical wandering where we wander with our feet, uh, take my feet and let them be, as we sing in the song. And uh, we want God to use us, but our feet take us places. And I see this as being in the wrong place, walking down the wrong path, and looking down the wrong way. I see that. And what does the Bible teach us in the words that I give us? The wrong road always leads to the wrong place. It never leads to the right place. The wrong road will not take you to the right place. In order to be in the right place, you have to get off of the wrong road and get on the right road. Because the wrong road will not lead. Say, well, I was on the wrong road and I met so-and-so. And you made a decision to get off the wrong road when that person was there. But the wrong road will never lead you to the right place. And so the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, in fact, it's repeated in Proverbs another time where it says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is a way, are the ways of death. It's a dead end street. And the wrong road will never take you to the right place. So a person will wander physically because they will walk someplace, look someplace, decide to be someplace where they should not be. And the longer one exposes himself to that which is wrong, the more like right it will appear to him. Let me say it again. The longer you are exposed to wrong, the more like right it will appear to you. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it when it's something that is definitely wrong. You see, the longer you're exposed to that wrong path, there's nothing going to be wrong with that. Proverbs chapter 7, the Bible says in verses 10 and 11, it describes the actions of an unvirtuous woman. It's very interesting. Proverbs 31 is the chapter in the Bible on the virtuous woman. <clears throat> there are no commands in that chapter, none whatsoever. It just describes what she does and why her husband safely trusts in her. But Proverbs chapter 6 gives us a characteristic about the unvirtuous woman. It says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. 
She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. She's on the wrong road. And this young man was on the wrong street. He was on the wrong corner. This is where he should have avoided that. Because the raw, and by the way, it ruined his life. Didn't ruin hers, but it ruined his. Her life was already wrecked and ruined with the sins of immorality. One person wrote, and I don't know who it was, but you see it all the time on bumper stickers of cars. It says, not all who wander are lost. However, many who wander go astray from being able to discern properly between right and wrong because they wander in the wrong direction. They wander down the wrong street. They wander into the wrong store. They wander into the wrong uh, place of amusement. They wander into the wrong place, and there they are influenced. So we understand this from the Bible. How, do, how does one wander? Uh, and the message title today, by the way, is Do You Wonder Why You Wander? Do, you're all reminded of the same Christmas song I am. I wonder as I wander. But, uh, and as I wrote this, and I thought that's a Christmas song if I remember it right. But do you wonder why you wander? Well, first of all, you wander physically. Number two, these folks wander mentally. They wander mentally. Literally, they allow their minds to wander into areas that are not good for any believer of any, any kind. You say, how do we stop that? Well, you know, did you know, uh, all my growing up years, I heard that the devil could put thoughts in your mind and he could read your mind and he could do all that. I read my Bible and found out that the only person who knows your heart and your mind is God. It says it twice in the Old Testament. God is the only one who knows it. So he can't read your mind. See, what about these psychics? They never win the lottery. And they don't know why you're calling. And why do they have a messaging machine if they can do that? You know, if they can read your mind. Uh, say, what, how, do, how do they do this? Oh, there's tricks to that. We won't go into it today. But they're all a farce. They're all a fake. The devil can't read your mind. The devil only has five portals to get into your mind. That's it. Just five. And the Bible makes it very clear what they are. First of all, those five are... Uh, our sight, what you see with your eyes. That's a, that's a gateway into your head, into your mind. And uh, uh, Billy Graham said many years ago, it's not a sin to see a woman indecently clad. It's a, same, it's a, it's a sin to look again. And I think his, his, his conclusion there was right. You can't avoid seeing some things. You see the billboard. You see the, uh, the, the sleaziness on the billboard advertising some beverage that they want you to buy or drink. Okay, you'll see it. Okay, to look back would be where you make your mistake. The second uh, portal into our minds is sound, what you hear. What you hear. Everywhere you go, you hear something. Everywhere you go, you hear my younger days, you know, you've heard my testimony. My, test, my, my goal in life was to be a rock and roll DJ. My idol was Greg Patton, who is now a pastor, by the way, in northwestern Indiana. And he got saved one night because a teenager took him, uh, took him home, took him to a youth activity, and he ended up getting saved. Amazing story of Greg Patton. I love his testimony. I have his testimony on the computer in here that I listened to. It came off of Unshackled. He had it there. Amazing testimony. But that was my life. But I'm here to tell you what, not everything that I listened to was amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I mean, I had things in my music library, and I was so proud of my music library, I don't think it was matched by anyone's. I made music my life. I understand music. But is it right for a Christian to have a, a record album? <laughs> An album, by the way, if there's any boys and girls listening, is a large vinyl disc that has music printed on both sides and is played on a turntable with a needle. So you can keep that in mind. But I had album after album. One of the albums that I owned was simply called Demons and Wizards. Now, let me to ask you a question. Is that really a good album for anybody to own? I won't even go into the names of the people that I had records from. That was my early years. That was a time of wandering. And you know, whether you believe it or not, your ears hear that music and they teach you philosophy. Remember one night, a number of years ago, as I was teaching about music here in this auditorium, I talked about the song, and we'll just sing in the sunshine. Everybody likes that song. Beautiful, lilty music. It's really nice. Until you listen to the words, and you realize it's about a woman and a man shacking up for a year, and if it doesn't work out, they can leave each other. 1960s. What you hear influences the philosophies of your life. And now some of you right now are thinking, I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to that song. 
And I advise you to do so, so that you understand that music is subtle. His way into your mind is through your music. Another uh, portal that he has into your mind is that of touch, of that of touch. See, Pastor, are you talking about our five senses? Yes, I am. That's the only way he has into your mind. Touch the wrong thing. Bible talks about the touch in many places. And the word that is used for touch is the Greek word, as if Greek meant anything to anybody here. The little Greek word for touch is the word hapto, H-A-P-T-O. And it simply means to, inst- to, in- to light a fire. And often the touch will light a fire in your heart or even in someone else's. And so the, 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 the touch is an avenue into your brain. <clears throat> then another one of the senses and another one of the avenues and portals that he has into our minds is that of taste. Is that of taste. You develop taste. The Bible talks about, about developing character in a child's life. It means to, to touch the palate, to make a, a, put it on a child's tongue when they're little and when they're just babies and develop a taste for a particular kind of food. Well, the Bible speaks very clearly about how to develop taste, and we have tastes in our lives. And if you're not careful, what you put in your mouth will develop a taste for something you should not have. And there are lots of things that are that way. And, of course, the last one is, the, is that of smell. And I know that uh, my dad was a smoker for many, many years. He quit. But walking by a tobacco store was difficult for him because it always smelled so good. Somebody said to me just this week, why do they have to make tobacco stores smell so good? And, by the way, for a non-smoker, they smell good. Okay? Because it's interesting. Now my Paul Paul Parton down in Tennessee, he's been in heaven for many, many years now, my Papa Parton grew tobacco on his little 10-acre uh, garden that he had there, a little spread that he had. And he used to hang his uh, tobacco up in a tobacco barn that he had. And you walk into that barn, and the smell of those plants as they were curing and all that was just overwhelming. It was so strong. But the smell is another way the devil has into your mind to develop a taste in you. You can't read your mind and say, well, the devil put that in my mind. No, he did not. He simply brought something into your life, kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. The thing that he brought into their lives was lust for their own money. And the Bible says, why well, had Satan put this into your heart? It wasn't that he was going in and putting it into their heart. He had to go through a desire that they had. And so, um, as, this, as this story goes and all the rest of it, uh, these are Satan's only ways to access your mind as he is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. He does not have the ability. But he knows, like any psychologist knows today, he knows how to get to your innermost thoughts. And he's good at it. I think it's in, and that's one of the reasons the Bible gives us guidelines on what to think and how to think. Say, well, what am I supposed to think on? I'm glad you asked. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. As he comes to these believers, he says, finally, brethren, he said, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. But we allow our minds to wander into areas that they should never wander. Upon what do you allow your mind to think? Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. The Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee, because he trusteth in thee. The believer has to be able to control his mind. How, we allow other things to control our thinking. Okay? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter, I was thinking about something that I was going to say, but decided not to say it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. It says, casting down imaginations. Do you realize this is not something God does for you? This is something you have to do on your own. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. That is not something God will do for you. That is something that you have to do on your own by the power of God and the influence of God. How do they wander? They wander physically. They wander mentally. How else do they wander? They, they wander sinfully. Say, so what do you mean by that? 
The word wander, as we go back to the different things that I gave you at the beginning on what the word means, one of the meanings that God has strategically placed in the word of God is the word wander or wandereth, and it means literally to be led astray. To be led astray. So some people get there because they're led there. And it relates to having our heart, listen now, um, for example, to be led away from proper discernment by something that will encourage you to do what's wrong. For example, alcoholic consumption. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. And do you remember what I taught you about the word drunk and the word filled? They mean to be controlled. People get controlled by alcohol. Someone says, oh, that was the alcohol talking. Or, oh, that was the drug talking. Oh, that was the, drug, the alcohol that made me do that. Well, we're talking about something that takes control of your mind. And uh, somebody will make a foolish decision while they are drinking or while they are on some drug or while they are uh, inhaling something or drinking something or swallowing something. And they'll make a decision during that time and they will wander often and they will no longer see it as wrong. The 16-year-old boy that I went to high school with, he was on acid. He was on LSD for four years. And he said to me one day in the gymnasium of our high school, he says, Danny, he said, I've been dropping acid. That means he's been taking drugs. I've been dropping acid for four years, and I've never had a bad trip yet. And I looked straight at him, and I said, key word, the word yet. Acid's not going to leave your body. You need to keep that in mind. People make decisions when they are controlled by another substance or by another individual or by some speech they heard or some teacher they heard or some false prophet that they listened to. And their mind is then controlled by that, it's sinning willfully because they've been led astray. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 says, uh, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And the Bible uses the word. Wine is a mocker, strong drink. It dif differentiates between the two. And in fact, in one chapter of the Bible, it says you're going to give alcohol to somebody, give it to somebody that's dying. It's not encouraging them to help the dying drink. It's saying give it to somebody that has no hope. It says because this will destroy kings. And it's very amazing how the Bible is so clear about that. Uh, drugs, the same thing. I remember my buddy in, in high school went to my home church. He got into drugs. I'm sitting in physical science class with him one day, and he had been smoking something. I don't know what it was. But he looked over at me, and he said, Hey, Danny. Hey, Danny. I looked over and said, Yeah, I called him by name. He said, Just want you to know that I can get you all the drugs you want for nothing. I can get them for you. As his eyes were all bloodshot and kind of wandering around in the sockets. I looked at him, and I called him by name. I said, Hey, sit up. I said, I want you to do something. He said, what's that? I said, I want you to follow my fingers. He said, all right. So I did this up, and he looked up, and I, and I said, don't move your head, just move your eyes. And so I said, up, down, up, down, right, left, and then I did this. <laughs> Blew his mind. He was so messed up. I asked him one day if I could borrow his car because I needed to go somewhere uh, during, during lunch hour or whatever it was. He says, yeah, but be careful. There's a hashish pipe in the seat. I got in the car, and there's that pipe laying there, and there's little burn marks all over the seat where the seeds had popped. I say, what did you do? I pushed it down in between the seats and drove under the speed limit everywhere I went. I wasn't about to get caught with a hash pipe. What I'm saying is he was under the influence of things, that controlled his thinking. And that's one of the portals through which the devil can get into your mind. And he can cause you to literally wander. And of course, my friend had wandered. <laughs> Something else. I have said so far that what causes a good Christian to wander away from discernment and proper thinking? I said, first of all, they wander physically. They go to the, literally to the wrong place. Their feet take them to the wrong place. I said, secondly, they wander mentally. And they allow, uh, they allow the wrong thoughts to come into their mind. I know when I was in school, I went to public school, and everybody who's ever been involved in public education has been influenced by socialism. It's something you have to get rid of using the word of God, the God's word in socialism out, but it's still in there. It's like Prego spaghetti sauce. It's in there. 
the music that I listened to when I was a teenager, let me tell you something, it's still in there. And I'm, listen, I'm going to be 67 this month. It's still in there. It doesn't go away. I can still quote music from my teenage years from the late 60s. I can quote word after word. And much of it I can, I can still play on the guitar. Say why? Because it doesn't go away. It stays in there. So it's a constant fight to fight that humanism and that worldliness that comes through all those different avenues. They wander mentally. Thirdly, they wander sinfully. They are led away by the wrong crowd, by the wrong friends, by the wrong influence. And then uh, fourthly, they wander unwittingly. I say, what do I mean by that? They wander unwittingly. Isaiah 5 and verse 20, we quoted it a moment ago, but it says, and Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, literally to be led astray by false teachers and their teaching. Then it relates to having hearts hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I've taught it here. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody else preach it. But in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, you have that phrase where it says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, what does that mean? Well, sin is deceitful. That's what it means. And it means that the longer you're exposed to it, the less wrong it's going to seem to you. Not everything that claims Christ is Christian. And not all who speak of Jesus are his. Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. <clears throat> Another one of those phrases in the Bible that is oft overlooked. But we, it catches us by surprise when we read it. But we don't think about it anymore. It says for in Acts 4.20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's going to be in there. Why? Because it doesn't go away. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little hands, what you touch. Be careful, little feet, where you go. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because all of those things affect us in way, one way or another. And you will speak what you see, and you will speak what you hear. And uh, we are more easily influenced than we think. We really honestly are. What do I mean? Our doctrine is adversely affected. By good people who believe differently. If we're not careful and if you're not well grounded in what you believe, you can learn to believe that which is wrong. I've written down a few things. For example, a uh, philosophy about salvation. Salvation is simple. Trusting Christ as your Savior. Some people have made it so difficult. I'm glad we have the track here in our church called God's Simple Plan of Salvation. Ford Porter wrote it back in the 1960s. It is one of the most popular tracts that has ever been written, and many hundreds of thousands of people have come to Christ through it. But all it is is a simple plan of salvation. You don't have to crawl on rocks. You don't have to repent of all of your sins, as some people say. First of all, you couldn't do that if you wanted to. You don't know all of your sins. And what if you missed one? Does that mean you're not going to be saved, of all things? Repentance has to do with the change of doctrine and what you believe. If you believe in another God, you've got to change that in order to trust Christ because you can't have Christ plus something else. And we all believe that Jesus saves plus and minus nothing. But if you're not careful, somebody's going to hand you the four spiritual flaws and tell you that in order to be saved, you have to make Jesus the boss of your life. That's called lordship. And that comes after you're saved. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you now, at this time, present your body as a living sacrifice. Lordship comes after salvation, not for it, you see. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mentioned repentance. It's a change of thinking about, that's why Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees or of the Pharisees, he said, except you repent, you'll likewise perish. Well, why did they need to repent? They were the quote unquote holiest people of their time. They had memorized literally the Pentateuch. But what did they believe? Salvation by works. And he told them you can't be saved by works. Never has been that way. Calvinism is another one that Jesus saves only the people that he's chosen. That's a lack of understanding. Whosoever means whosoever. I studied the word one day. <laughs> Brother Daniel, I found out that whosoever means whosoever. 
But I had a Calvinist tell me one day that whosoever only stands for people that God has chosen. I'm sorry. If you're not careful, you'll be confused like what I was confused when I was growing up. My pastor, who is now in heaven, when I was a teenager, he said this one day from the pulpit. He now knows it was wrong. And he got it from a guy who preached in the 17th, 1700s. He says, I don't understand. I don't understand. He says, I don't, under, what was the word he says? I don't understand being chosen. I don't understand predestination. He said, but all I know is this, on this side of heaven's gate, it says whosoever. And on the other side, it says chosen from the foundation of the world. That's probably the most confusing statement I've ever heard in my life. I don't get it. But what they don't understand is that choosing has to do with the Jews, not with Christians being saved or anyone being saved. Eternal security. There are those who will say, oh, I believe, that, I believe in the eternal security of the believer, but you can lose it. You can give it up. You can quit believing, and then you're no longer saved. The Bible doesn't say any of that. It says that we're kept by the power of God. And you know what? That's good enough for me in my backslidden days. And by the way, it's good enough for you in your backslidden condition when you get that way. You see, what we hear affects what we believe. Inspiration and preservation of Scripture. There are people that don't believe that the Bible is God's word. But at one time that they did, but they heard some teacher say, or they read their note in the middle of their Schofield Bible that says, this passage of Scripture has no authority. Really? Because it's not found in the oldest and the best manuscripts? You mean the ones they threw away? And if we're not careful, we will say that. As my, one, my preacher said many years ago, he didn't believe it by the time he died. He said, there's no doctrine affected adversely in the Bible through the different translations of Scripture. Found out later on he was wrong because there are major doctrines that are affected. So our doctrine can be adversely affected over time. But something else, our practice can be adversely affected over time. Personal holiness. You talking about sinlessness? Not on your life. Not on your life. Lester Roloff, God bless him, he was up preaching one time. And um, after he got done preaching, somebody leaned over to him and said, Lester, he said, you believe all that? He said, goodness, no. He said, it's a, it's a goal that I have. And I thought, you know, that's good. You preach the truth whether you practice it or not, and then you grow into practicing it as you're supposed to. You are not the Christians we ought to be, but if you're growing in Christ, thank God you're not what you used to be. Attitudes are affected by what we hear. There's so much hatred today in, in our Christianity, so much, so much disgruntledness, hatred coming from the pulpits of our, not just preaching the truth, but preaching hatred. We have to be very, very careful. Our philosophies about our entertainment, about our language, about our friendships, about our relationships, and all the rest of it is affected by what we hear, what we see, what we touch, what we taste, what we smell. Why do people wander? You ever wonder why you wander? Have you ever said this to yourself when you were backslidden? Uh, don't even raise your hand because I know you have. You said to yourself, how did I get here? How did I get here? How did I change from what I was to what I am? And your Christianity now is only a shadow of what it once was. How did you go from being a fundamental Bible believer to being a new evangelical Bible denier? How did I get here? How did I do that? How did I go from salvation by grace alone to thinking that God only chooses certain people to be saved? How did I get there? How did I change my morality? How did I change my attitude? How did I change all these things in my life? It did not happen all of a sudden. Nobody fell into it. It happened one little step at a time. And there are many examples of those who have become more shadows of what they, mere shadows of what they used to be in Christ. Are they still saved? Well, if they got saved, of course they are. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. They agreed on that. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And John the Baptist taught the same thing in John 3, 36, everything the same. 
So if you're not careful, you'll turn into one that says, like when I witness to people, I'll say, uh, I say, well, I'm, hi, my name is Dan Parton. I'm from the Timberline Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come. Oh, he, I used to be a Baptist, they'll say. And I say, oh, well, are you a saved? Or they'll say, I'm a Baptist, or I went to a Baptist church. I say, well, are you a saved Baptist? And there's a difference between a Baptist and a saved Baptist. More often than not, this is an exact quote that I hear back. Well, I used to be. Nobody used to be saved. You a saint or you ain't. You're saved or you're lost. You're in or you're out. You're on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. But there is no halfway house and there is no used to be. What are they saying? Probably been out of church for a long time or got under some bad teaching. You see, very amazing. So let me ask you this. Do you wonder why you wander? There is a danger of wandering out of the way of understanding. You become, you become a member of the wrong crowd. You have, if you've ever wondered why some have wandered so far from the right path of understanding, it's because they have wandered first physically. Their feet took them someplace they shouldn't have gone. What a terrible situation. They uh, think about that mentally. They read something or they uh, thought something or had a thought process that they shouldn't have. Or they did this. They were praying one time and all of a sudden their mind was filled with, with the filth of the world. And they said out loud to the devil while they were praying, get thee behind me, Satan. Well, that's wrong. I don't ever talk to the enemy. And James says the reason you have those thoughts and do those things is because you're drawn away of your own lust. And enticed. It wasn't the devil to begin with, and that's why you never got victory. Mentally, because you have wandered away sinfully, because you've wandered away unwittingly. And be careful not to allow anything or anyone to influence you away from the way of understanding. And so we find in our opening passage here, it talks about those men and men and women who wander from the way. Well, be careful what goes in your, your five senses. Because that will affect you all the way. And it may change you to a direction to where you're now wandering off. Say, well, it's only a little bit. Brother Penn, you're my mathematician genius in this room. When you vary just a little bit at the beginning on a tangent, it's not bad, is it? I mean, it doesn't look bad at all. You take two points and just change it just by a little bit. Just by a little bit. It's called a tangent. A lot of Christians change how their lives change when they get on tangents. And at the very beginning, it doesn't look too bad. But a few years out, that little tangent is turned into miles from where you used to be. So the best thing to do is to not let yourself wander. Keep those things, keep your five senses in check so that you're not tempted to wander. And then one day you'll sit there and say, and you're, going to be wander, you're going to be wondering why you wandered, and you're going to say, how did I get here? How did I get where I'm at? And then you've got to make some changes to get back to where you were. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wisdom that is found in Proverbs. This one little verse. That